Welcome to the What's on Tap with Dr. Kay Torian Easterling of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, before we start, I just want to remind everyone to spread the ABNY word by tweeting and posting on social. Our ad is at a better NY. Um, and with that, I will kick it off to our amazing YP host, Joy. Thank you so much all for joining. Hi. And welcome everyone. I just want to start off by saying thank you to the ABNY YP board and to the ABNY team for making awesome events like this possible. It's such a pleasure this evening to have the opportunity to speak with Dr. Torian Easterling. Uh, but first, I just want to quickly introduce myself. Um, my name is Joy Ray. I currently serve as chief of staff at a national nonprofit that advocates for STEM education. It's called 100 K and 10. But before my current role, I served in NYC government for many years, uh, and I care deeply about being a public servant and more broadly about just, I'm obsessed with being a New Yorker and I love this city. Um, and I really jumped at the opportunity to speak with Dr. Easterling in part because despite being a public servant, despite working in nonprofits, um, everyone in my family and who's closest to me is involved in working in medicine. and so. With Dr. Easterling's career, uh, bridging those two things, uh, I'm always excited to speak with folks who are both passionate about, you know, saving lives and helping people, and also working in government and being a public servant. So, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Easterling. Um, excuse me, one second. Just going to bring it up. Apologies, I'm having technical difficulties. I'm just going to bring up Dr. Easterling's bio so I don't make any uh, errors. We'll probably we'll probably hit a lot of the the bio as we go through the questions too. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I'm having a little bit of a technical error here. No problem. So Dr. Easterling is second in command at New York City Health and Health, New York City, excuse me, New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, where he serves as the agency's first deputy commissioner and the chief equity officer. In his role, Dr. Easterling coordinates all non-COVID health matters for the agency and he is responsible for unifying the health department's internal and external equity agenda as its first ever chief equity officer. Prior to his current role, Dr. Easterling served as deputy commissioner of the Center for Health Equity and Community Wellness at DOHMH, where he oversaw programmatic work focused on reducing overall premature mortality and closing the racial gap on the leading causes of preventable death. He also served as assistant commissioner of the Department of Health's Bureau of Brooklyn Neighborhood Health, uh, where he helped advance key programming to address pressing concerns, including maternal deaths and gun violence. And Dr. Easterling is doing amazing work to help protect the health of New Yorkers. So without further ado, I'm gonna start you know, asking him questions and uh, letting us hear directly from him. Uh, so Dr. Easterling, it's such a pleasure and an honor to be here with you. Could you please tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure, um, and the pleasure is, is mine as well, Joy. Uh, thank you for uh, so much to agreeing to having this conversation with me. Um, certainly, uh, thank you to Abby um, New York for for hosting uh, this event and, and spotlighting me and the, and the career that I have and the work that I'm doing. Uh, so, uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a family physician. Uh, board certified and also um, board certified as a preventive medicine physician. Uh, so essentially, uh, completed two residencies. Uh, one is clinical, and one is one is more health administration, health policy focused. Uh, thinking about how do we use additional tools to um, promote health uh, and, and address um, disease transmission, 
uh, and really reduce uh, inequities. And so, um, you know, I went to medical school, uh, you know, graduated from, uh, from Morehouse College. Uh, you know, I um, also was a proud member of uh, Alpha Phi Alpha Incorporated. So I checked a lot of the good boxes of, you know, really, um, you know, trying to navigate uh, spaces that, um, you know, really trying to move in this world and trying to be uh, productive. Um, but, you know, in, in, the, in the other boxes that, you know, folks do not expect uh, that I checked, you know, you know, the question is, did I play basketball? Well, yes, but I also, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a fencer. I play water polo and did a lot of other things. Love to hike. And so, you know, really trying to, um, you know, speak to our narratives that, uh, that being authentic um, for yourself is really like how you show up and really um, enjoying your own passions and really being able to explore for yourself um, who you are and, and what you really like. So, you know, that's me. Uh, that's a little bit about myself. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, so you, you touched on this a little bit, but could you tell us a little bit more and do a deeper dive on how you got where you are today? Yeah, so the, the how is, um, you know, that that's probably for the, the final autobiography, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, sort of like this moment right here, you know, as you mentioned, um, you know, in the bio, uh, I've been at the New York City Department of Health for five years already, um, actually longer than five years, um, and I've served in multiple roles. Now, my previous role prior to coming to the health department um, I, uh, you know, I was an assistant professor, uh, you know, at um, a medical school in New Jersey where I had both clinical duties, um, uh, seeing patients uh, four times a week, um, and also teaching medical students while also doing my own health promotion research. Um, and, you know, sort of the academic grind is a grind in of itself, um, but sort of that direct result impact um, you also don't see when you're in the academic space, certainly as a clinician when you have your own patients, um, but it's, it's slower. And so uh, moved into public service, into government, um, and once the opportunity arose, because it was also an, an idea of how do you think about health promotion, uh, disease prevention um, at a community level. Uh, and certainly there's a pathway that got me here, um, but certainly started um, both in college and in medical school um, and really understanding uh, that um, there are multiple factors that you know, people really look to that controls and impacts um, their overall well-being. You know, certainly, certainly their their political landscape, their environmental landscape, certainly the social and educational factors that also play in. Um, and I got to experience this both as a college student and a medical student, um, responding to uh, you know natural disasters, public health emergencies, uh, and so you know certainly it has prepared me um, to where I am right now, uh, leading um, uh, public health. Uh, you know, public health uh, department, uh, leading uh, the work that I'm doing. Um, but also, part of it is also just recognizing that um, some of this is out of my control and being, you know, um, available and being ready to step in. Um, and sometimes you, you don't know what those moments are going to be um, when you're called to step into that moment. And so it's being prepared uh, for, um, you know, for the unexpected, uh, and how do you do that? Uh, and I think it's constantly sort of thinking about, you know, just uh, moving and thinking about the ways in which you're going to, you know, increase um, your ability uh, to, um, you know, always elevate yourself, right? And what are those things that you want to do? Uh, so I think that's part of the process. Um, it is a process. It's an everyday process that you're learning yourself. You're learning your strengths, your weaknesses, and the things that you want to improve upon. Um, and again, always just being open uh, for that un unexpected moment. Absolutely. And we have someone in the chat. Someone in the chat um, said, "Go HBCU." So that 
kind of reading my mind and leading to the next question of how did graduating from a prestigious historically black college and university like Morehouse prepare you for your current career? Um, I know there's a great network that's really um, particularly in New York City, powerful folks who really support each other and uh, HBCUs make that possible. So I'd love to hear from you more about that. Yeah, cer certainly. Um, you know, when when I arrived, uh, you know, in that on that place that that Ray Clay Hill in Georgia, um, I didn't know what to expect. Truthfully, uh, you know, arriving at Morehouse College, um, and certainly it has prepared me uh, in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, I say that um, you know medical school prepared me to be a black man in this world, and. Um, and so that education is just as valuable as the education that I received in the classroom. Um, and certainly preparing myself as a biology pre-med, uh, Morehouse uh, certainly did an exceptional job um, because it was also the opportunity that it afforded me. Um, you know, not only going through uh, the rigmarole of, um, you know, my studies, but also giving me the opportunity to be uh, you know, a recipient of the, the Minority Biomedical Research Support or the Minority Access Research Careers that then not only provided me um, scholarships, but also a network, a network of scientists, physician scientists, of PhDs, you know, of epidemiologists. And that exposure and people who look like me expanded my understanding of science, biomedical science, and medical careers. Um, and so I already understood that there were public health departments moving in this space of thinking about health, inequity, health inequities and health disparities. Um, and certainly not to say that I could not get a good education uh, at a predominantly white institution, but how do those resources and those opportunities show up um, for a person of color? Uh, and certainly Morehouse created a pathway and an avenue um, and then on the other side, it's just um, uh, reaffirming uh, my culture, the values uh, of who I am. Um, and certainly, and again, other institutions, um, there's always this question of, if I show up uh, at a guidance counselor uh, in a professor's office, what type of instructions, what type of support uh, am I going to receive? And certainly at Morehouse, I didn't have to question it. Certainly, I was going to be um, uh, I could be scolded and, you know, and certainly instructed, uh, you know, in a very stern way. And sometimes you, you certainly needed it, but um, there was a lot of love and support as well that went along with those stern, stern reminders. That's wonderful. Thank you. So we, we talked a little bit about um, college, a little bit about medical school. Now going into your residency, you completed your residency in family medicine at Jamaica Hospital Medical Center in Queens. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, um, did you experience any inequities in healthcare delivery there that shaped your perspective on your current work? I think I have a feeling, I have a sense of what this answer might be, but I'd love to hear your perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think it, um, it's important to understand that there's a level of consciousness that one has to have to recognize that those inequities exist in the first place um, before you even take on the path of becoming whatever professional that you are looking for um, and that you're aspiring to be. Um, and certainly our educational system uh, has, is already rooted uh, in a white supremacist culture. And we have to be honest about that. We have to be transparent uh, that that culture uh, that structure uh, is very much in the fabric of this country. Um, there are multiple ways that it has shown up, not only in my residency, but also in medical school. Um, when we talk about um, those disparities, we, you know, we constantly hear in medical school uh, that black people are, have, the, are the, leading, have the leading causes of death and diabetes and hypertension without giving the context of structural racism, how structural racism has shown up um, and how housing was allocated in communities, how education um, was um, deprived and disinvested in certain communities. 
and that led to those health outcomes. And never did we have that conversation about the structural racism and how it led to poor health outcome. And so when you teach um, thousands of medical students uh, that black people have the leading cause of, of diabetes, and then you transfer them into an environment uh, where they have to do uh, critical thinking uh, and really diagnostic uh, thinking around medical care. Certainly, all they're doing is sort of uh, imputing what they've heard in school. Uh, oh, so this person is black. Well, they likely have high rates of diabetes and hypertension and not taking into account the social context, uh, not taking into account you know, the long histories of discrimination and bias that shows up. Uh, in, in our healthcare institutions. And we do certainly do not have to go back 30 or 40 years to see that discrimination. We can see it now. It's been in papers. It's been documented um, how black uh, New Yorkers, how black people are treated in healthcare systems and certainly have seen this firsthand. Uh, and so, you know, it, we already see this in medical school where black and Latino students represent you know, only you know, nine, 10% of the population of students who are even being educated. Um, and there are certainly a higher percentage of the population uh, in this entire country. And so you know, when we can begin to write that ship, um, really achieving equity um, and, and who is being accepted into medical schools, who is being accepted into residency, who are becoming doctors, how are we teaching models of care, uh, and it's also important to recognize that the long-standing disinvestment of how we even teach medicine, you know, you can go back into the early 1900s. In the Flexner Report, which is very, very important because the American Medical Association has recently come out and declared racism as a public health issue because of their role in disinvesting in healthcare institutions and in medical care institutions where, um, you know, hospitals that predominantly serve people of color uh, they work to shut those hospitals down, those medical schools down, very clear about traditional therapies, therapies from other parts of the country, other parts of the world, um, you know, from indigenous populations, from the continent, weren't even being accepted or taught in medical school. So, you know, when you know that you're dealing in this medical industrial complex, then you really have to do additional work uh, to make sure that you're framing uh, is an anti-racist framing. And then you're also that consciousness of being able to recognize how structural racism is playing out. Really important. Absolutely. That's so important. And yeah, that's powerful. Thank you. Uh, you. You touched on this a little bit, but I'm wondering if we can kind of dive even deeper um, just to talk a little bit more about how you decided to de combine your medical career with public health service um, and public health. Um, I'd love to hear more about that because you talked a little bit about the structural issues. It's not just health, it's other things though. Um, if we can do a little bit of a deeper dive of how you see those things intersecting um, more broadly in your career. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, my, my, my medical career, I owe it really all, all to my mother. Um, this was uh, something that she really had inspired to be, was a physician. Um, and so, uh, but ended up becoming uh, a lab scientist and really working at pharmaceutical industries, made a choice about not becoming a physician. Um, uh, and certainly didn't know that story, but when I had shared with her, not really hearing her story until much later, that I wanted to be a doctor, um, her immediate reaction was really just to support support that goal and that vision for, for myself and I've had it since I was a young boy. Um, and so that's the start of it. Um, but again, it's sort of like, how do you move, you know, in this educational journey, um, in your training, and getting to this place of a framing where you want to use, uh, you know, your work uh, to eliminate and dismantle structural racism, um, to advance a racial and social justice, um, you know, uh, uh, framing. Uh, and I, you know, I think that there were so many different um, 
factors that really played into it, um, experiences that inform that process from, as I said, you know, responding and being a part of teams that responded to public health emergencies, um, you know, you know, like, you know, being in Haiti uh, in response to the earthquake uh, in 2010, um, you know, to uh, being in Liberia and really doing uh, some global medicine work um, in response to the civil war conflict and post-civil war really trying to help uh, Liberia and Sierra Leone uh, sort of recapture uh, what it means to, um, you know, really rebuild a country uh, and what are all those things that you need and certainly healthcare services, you know, um, bringing your medical school back, teaching students how to become physicians and being part of that process. Um, and sort of seeing this as a global struggle, you know, um, and that, you know, your constant fight is for humanity. And how did you do that? Um, and what are the ways in which you can show acts of solidarity even through um, your, your profession? Uh, and so I've certainly been striving to do that, um, both globally and, and locally. And I think that there are certainly ways that we can do that. Um, uh, and certainly, uh, you know, I think this is really important, you know, to really have uh, those principles, um, you know, even when you know that your organizations, again, that there are structures and systems that are set up in place and like, how do you navigate those spaces? And I think that those, there have to be real conversations for folks who are currently in, um, uh, in the workforce or entering the workforce. Um, but certainly, you know, want to be a part of this conversation about how do we really create and reimagine spaces that are new, that are safe for individuals, that are safe for people of color, uh, that are also safe for individuals who come and live at this place of like intersecting systems of oppression. Like we have to have those conversations. Mm -hmm. I would love to do a kind of deep dive on all the work you've done, but I'm going to keep it to the questions that we have planned for this evening. Um, thank you for all that you've shared. Uh, particularly, I'd love to hear more about your current work as the first Chief Equity Officer at DOHVH. How did this role originate? And can you talk about the importance of having this kind of position um, at DOHVH? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, the, the role, the role, you know, to be transparent, the role came about uh, through a vision, you know, a vision that I think has been set for our agency now, thinking about how we are addressing structural racism. Uh, the path has been set um, certainly by some phenomenal leaders, starting with Dr. Mary T. Bassett, um, who became the commissioner here at the New York City Health Department. Uh, in 2014 under this administration uh, and, you know, after the ruling of, of Eric Gardner was very clear uh, that, uh, you know, racism uh, and the health inequities that we see are unfair and avoidable and unnecessary. And we have to do everything in our powers and the work that we do as public health professionals and medical professionals to dismantle structural racism. And so that, that call to action was very clear to me, even as an assistant professor uh, in the medical school in New Jersey. And then when I joined the agency um, years later, uh, said that, you know, really wanted to be a part of this work. Uh, and so, you know, uh, you know, then moving forward with uh, a race to justice framing in our agency, creating a center for health equity, then leading that Center for Health Equity uh, for a little over a year. And then our current commissioner is saying that we need to take the next step of really operationalizing um, our equity work uh, in um, our agency, but then also making sure that very clear how we're bringing that work all together uh, under one role. And that's how the Chief Equity Officer uh, was created. And so again, um, you know, as I've been saying, is that there have been people in this administration that have been planting the seeds, watering the fields, and now folks are stepping in and really it's harvest time, right? And like, we have to continue to advance this work um, that folks have been building on. So certainly honored to be standing on some amazing shoulders. Um, I think what it means for agencies to 
create a role like a chief equity officer and, and really just beyond this idea of like diversity and inclusion of one, it's important to acknowledge that structural racism exists within your organization and exists within our society. Um, and then that your organization is going to take the ne necessary steps um, to name how structural racism is showing up and doing the work to undo those structures and operationalizing a plan that's going to continue to advance and center the lives of the people in your workforce, but then also the people that you serve. Um, and then, so acknowledging is very important. And then also acknowledging that this chief equity officer should not be a permanent role, right? Like uh, equity work should be something that we should be really working to integrate into the full fabric of the organization, of this country. And so we should be working ourselves out of a job if you're really in the equity space. That's definitely no small task. So my next question is just to better understand what your day-to-day -day looks like, what your uh, current thinking is and what you're pushing forward. So you're responsible for unifying the health department's internal and external equity agendas. What exactly does that mean? And can you explain points of tension between internal and external approaches? Yeah, no, th this is a really good, really good, great question. Um, so I appreciate you for asking it. Uh, well, you know, unify unifying our internal and external approaches, um, really it's, it's one approach. Um, you know, we need to be able to see our workforce uh, and the you know, majority of our workforce are black and brown people, and particularly in the entire city administration and live in neighborhoods that we need to continue to do the necessary work of reinvesting, um, really making sure that we're reimagining, um, you know, public safety, public health infrastructure. And so, you know, the folks that we're serving in the neighborhoods are also the same people uh, that are doing the work uh, in, in this administration, in the, in the agency. So um, we're serving the, the same people ultimately. Um, and, you know, our internal, uh, approach is really looking at how we are, um, you know, examining our structures. So we've done equity assessments, you know, of, you know, um, the work that we do, you know, from our programmatic area. What are the policies that you know we put out? How are we thinking about uh, our investments and so our budget uh, and thinking about hiring and diversity? So those are part of the work of our internal approaches, but then also the trainings. And so we've done trainings. Um, over, over the last five years of really talking about how we normalize structural racism, having conversations, and so that you can be more explicit in your work, particularly not only about place, but also race, um, because we do need race explicit goals if we are going to be really narrowing the gaps um, and really addressing inequities and how they show up uh, in health outcomes. You know, our external work, um, continues because that's a lot of the work that extends into our programs, right? And so thinking about the work that we do in neighborhoods like North and Central Brooklyn or uh, other neighborhoods in the South Bronx or neighborhoods that are in Northern Manhattan, where we do see, you know, high rates of, you know, premature mortality or infant mortality, uh, you know, and this is the work of really thinking about how we're convening with, you know, and working with, um, you know, other city agencies, sister agencies, community partners, uh, you know, uh, working with the federal government, with the state government, to really think about how we could bring those investments, um, think about how we're shifting those resources, uh, particularly into the hands of community-based organizations who've been doing critical work. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that that tension really that um, you, you talked about is sort of how it does reimagining and creating these new structures uh, sort of butt up against sort of the old structures that you're working to dismantle, right? And I think that's, that's how um, uh, you can get, you lean into those uncomfortable moments and have those conversations, right? Like the easy part is just to deal, to go with what's already, the status quo, right? You know, if, if a policy is in place and you said, oh, well, we cannot move forward with this because, um, you know, this is this is the way that we've always done it. But the question is, why? Why have we done it? Right? Is there like is this a legal issue? Is this a funding issue? Is it because there's actually something in the charter? So these are questions that we have to ask as leadership, as staff, um, if we're going to really be able to advance the forward. 
you know, that's really powerful. And I, I know firsthand how difficult change is in government. So really appreciate um, hearing the work you're doing. So I kind of want to turn a little bit to ask questions specifically around the issue on everyone's minds, which is COVID-19, of course, particularly for New Yorkers being one of the first and hardest hit in the US. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, what has the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene done to ensure equitable vaccine distribution for communities hardest hit by COVID-19? Yeah, um, appreciate the question. Uh, this is something that you know, we've been paying attention since um, you know the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and I think you know vaccine distribution um, does not become equitable you know without paying attention to how we've seen this pandemic really impact neighborhoods across New York City. Um, you know we've been hearing how COVID nineteen has impacted Black and Brown communities in New York City, um, and so you know thinking about the ways in which we can. Um, saturate resources in those neighborhoods and really uh, engage those communities, right? So just our resources, working with community partners, and then now having at our disposal an additional tool because we still cannot forget about our core four, wearing a mask and do all the other things that we've been doing for the past year, six feet apart. You know, I know that folks want to reopen, but we're not there yet, right? And so we haven't reached population immunity where we can really say, uh, that everyone is protected and so you know our vaccines is part of you know this plan of really rolling back and pushing back on this virus and slowing disease transmission so really important to say that we're still paying attention to all of the metrics that we were paying attention to a year ago right in cases and percent positivity and hospitalizations and how are they impacting those who are most uh you know at risk for severe illness the vaccine, certainly the rollout is going to help us make sure that we can protect those uh, that are most at risk of severe illness. And certainly community, black and brown communities do, do stand to be in that category, most at risk. And for a number of different reasons, certainly not genetics, certainly um, not biological in origin, but we know that this is the social construct, structural racism and how it has played out. You know, from workforce, thinking about who are mostly our frontline essential workers, right? Who are you thinking about housing? So who is living in or work out of housing or multi-generational homes? And so really thinking about how we can protect those families. Our vaccine rollout um, certainly has been um, really keeping equity front and center, thinking about those ways. And so, you know, vaccine uh, distribution, um, you know, we've been thinking about the neighborhoods uh, that we need to make sure that uh, is, has access to the vaccine, thinking about our allocation and bringing more of those vaccines into those neighborhoods through the providers that are set up and are able to vaccinate individuals. Also making sure that we're working with community partners so that they can help individuals schedule appointments either through our call center or actually getting on the website for someone to make sure that they can schedule an appointment. We're doing door to door and we have canvases going out literally knocking on doors and scheduling appointments for our elders. We're providing transportation resources for our elders to any vaccine site. And so these are ways that we can certainly achieve our equity goals. We're not there yet, uh, and that's very clear. We share the data on our website, and you can see this, uh, nyc.gov uh, slash COVID vaccine. We, we have not seen you know, the uptake across all race and ethnicities. Um, and we certainly have to do more to close those gaps. We're certainly not seeing for across our age groups. And so we want to get our seniors vaccinated as well. And you can also look at the neighborhoods and we have ma a map of New York City um, and we haven't reached uh, the uptake in all of the neighborhoods in the same way. And so certainly more that we need to do uh, to, to reach our equity goals. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I have another question about this um, related specifically to how COVID is affecting Black and Brown communities. So there's been a lot of coverage about vaccine hesitancy in Black and Brown communities. And what has been your experience on the ground with regards to this? Um, and how is, I know you touched on this a little bit, but how is um, TOHMH addressing this on the ground? 
Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, our, our approach is, is first starting with um, changing the narrative. Um, and what we understand is that, you know, um, you know, people are thinking about the vaccine, questioning the vaccine, uh, interested in taking the vaccine, but want to know more. And so doing mass um, education around, around the vaccine. There are already folks who are, you know, primed and ready to get vaccinated, you know, and certainly I was one of them. Uh, I am now vaccinated and just a week out from being fully vaccinated uh, because I got my second dose on February 7th and then two weeks after my second dose, uh, March 7th, excuse me, and then you're fully vaccinated. Um, and so um, we're, we're really looking at ways that we can bring the information, factual information into our communities, helping individuals make informed decision, right? Because, you know, just last year, you know, we were really just reeling from this whole pandemic. And then we started talking about a vaccine and then we gave folks this, you know, arbitrary timeline. So 18 months before a vaccine is, is ready. And then we have a vaccine that's ready in December. And so it was like, wait, what? So, you know, it is totally fine for folks to have questions about this vaccine. Um, and want to know, is it going to keep me safe? Is it effective? Should I be taking it right now? So if you're eligible, my message is yes, it is safe. It is effective. And if you're eligible, you should be taking the vaccine. Now, if someone has questions, totally fine, right? And so I'm not quick to label anyone as being hesitant, right? And, and certainly not, you know, um, uh, painting as broad brush for black communities that black communities are hesitant. There are multiple factors here, right? We acknowledge that our healthcare system uh, has not been kind and really the harsh words, really understanding that we know that discrimination and bias has shown up in our healthcare systems. We know that we've been telling our elders to stay home, right? And hunker down and lock down. And so all this messaging that's been going out, now we're telling folks, come get vaccinated. Right, and so how do we support individuals to make an informed decision? How do we support them in understanding how they can schedule their appointments and then helping them get to those appointments, knowing what information they need to bring so that they can then um, get vaccinated, you know, proof of eligibility, making sure that the language is the correct language so that they can navigate those spaces and then coming back for your second dose, a lot of steps here because usually we're telling people to go to their primary care doctor. Um, and so there's a lot of steps that we as government, we gotta put in place to make this easy. We need to minimize all barriers. Um, and we've, we've done some of that work uh, and we, we're gonna continue to look at and be responsive. Um, and so I think the onus is on us. It's on the institutions, it's on the government to make this um, as easy as possible. that um so talked a lot about covid i'm going to ask you a little bit more general broad questions and um my next question is what public health issues are you focused on outside of covid19 and what are some of the other priorities for your department yeah so in addition to you know really making sure that we can you know um we continue to slow the spread of, of COVID-19 transmission, getting out our vaccines. Um, we're also paying close attention to these parallel pandemics. Prior to COVID-19, there was certainly widespread social and economic disability uh, in, in New York City and in specific communities. And how we continue to, to address that. And we've certainly seen this being amplified, um, you know, food insecurity, housing insecurity, and certainly the trauma and the grief uh, that you know, New Yorkers are, are feeling at this time. Um, and so paying attention uh, to one, how we can uh, support and expand our public health workforce, of how can we reimagine a public health system uh, that really is going to protect communities, keep them safe, and not just thinking about healthcare access, but really thinking about the wholeness uh, in a person and all the different ways uh, that factors can impact someone's health. As I mentioned before, environmental, educational, social, political, all these different ways we need to keep in mind and we need to partner. And so 
the health department, we need to um, move and operate a little bit differently and work with our sister city agencies and other partners to really think about what are those infrastructures that we need to put in place. Um, and certainly, um, before we can even get there, we're going, we're, when we get through this recovery process, we need to think about how are we really supporting people through this recovery process. Um, it's going to be a lot. This pandemic has touched us all in direct and indirect ways, large and small ways, and we're certainly going to have to help people navigate. Um, normalcy, we're going to have to redefine. Um, we're going to have to allow people to take their time and really re-engage what it means to come back into public and into the society. What does it mean to step back onto the subway and feel safe, right? Not because you think someone is going to attack you, um, but because you want to feel safe about the air that you're breathing and that you're not exposing yourself, or even this vaccine, or even going to your provider, your healthcare provider. You know, there are many questions that we know that people are facing at this very moment. And certainly the vaccine help us, helps us get closer to it, uh, but we have to continue having those discussions. And we can't have it just within our institution. We need to do this with community, right? Um, we need to be able to be in community, really thinking about a collective strategy that's going to really support individuals getting to that next phase. Important. You, you touched on a little bit kind of breaking down of silos and the importance of that uh, in order to have a really comprehensive plan for the health of New Yorkers. So my next question relates to that. How does the department, um, DOHMH, uh, work with other organizations such as public health hospitals to coordinate on equity issues facing New Yorkers? Yeah, well, you know, this is work that we have been doing um, for for now um, close to two decades uh, through our neighborhood health action centers um, that are in the neighborhoods that I spoke about before. Um, really, you know, uh, investing in these underutilized health department buildings to think about how we can do local organizing, local planning to come up, develop health uh, strategies uh, that could, you know, that can be evaluated and really could be expanded. And so there has been a lot of work that we've been doing uh, in these local um, uh, health department buildings, working with other city agencies like New York City Housing Authority, like Housing uh, Preservation Development, thinking about ACS, but also thinking about um, community-based organizations, houses of worships, and others to really think about local planning. And even, you know, thinking about even like the local you know, governance bodies such as your community boards and other boards that are that are in those neighborhoods, and to come up with those health strategies, but understand that those health strategies need to be intersecting, right? Thinking about housing, thinking about um, public safety, um, thinking about how we're addressing violence as a public health issue. So all these different things, um, but certainly there's more work that we can do, uh, and um, you know, the, we've taken additional steps. Um, we've just hired. Uh, on board our chief, our first ever chief medical officer, Dr. Michelle Morris, who is also now serving as the deputy commissioner for the Center for Health Equity and Community Wellness. And part of that, part of her work, and then her role is really engaging uh, chief medical officers and chief equity uh, executive officers at healthcare systems, and really thinking about how we bridge healthcare systems more towards public health, and really thinking about health promotional activities that can really address upstream factors. And so, you know, making those type of investments, right? How are we addressing, you know, uh, premature mortality, right? Through cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension. How do we leverage federal funds and state funds to really reinvest them back into communities through public health workforce? Or thinking about, uh, you know, collective mechanisms, whether they're pan structures or they're really thinking about organizing structures for people to come together and come up with uh, solutions and strategies. So, you know, certainly there are ways that we can advance it forward. Um, and certainly we need to think about policies and regulatory bodies that can really codify the way that um, we want to continue to um, do equity assessments and really continue to do equity work. So these are all the different work, different ways in which we work, right? Uh, city agencies, city council, elected officials, 
but also working with uh, institutions as well. That's, that's great, thank you. I have one more question before we move to the q and I'm hoping to, because all of this is important, but uh, kind of heavy stuff to, to talk about. Um, and there's a lot of hope on the horizon. We've got vaccine distribution, we've got consciousness around racial equity and the disparities that exist. So my last question to you, Dr. Easterling, is uh, looking to the future, what challenges are you most excited to see occur in the states, just broadly? Um, so, uh, you know, I, I've been still riding uh, the wave of November 2020, and it's been amazing to see the organizing that happened to help people get out to polls. Um, and really have been uh, really inspired by that work and, uh, you know, still uh, trying to tap into that momentum uh, to help people get supported uh, to get their vaccine. Um, but I think then that conversation and that momentum needs to carry into the next uh, election and other civic engagement activities, but also, you know, having these conversations around reimagining public health um, and reimagining public safety. Um, I think those structures that we want um, collectively, um, we have to do it uh, together. Uh, and, um, and I think that's what I've been really excited about, uh, about the new partnerships that have been created out of, you know, the despair, um, you know, with COVID-19, uh, the, uh, the, the new ways of thinking. Um, and, uh, and I think that is giving me hope um, that yes, you know, there are things that we certainly need uh, and uh, that will provide security for families and communities. Um, but I certainly think that we can come out of this, uh, you know, that will create an environment that's going to really support and center the lives of, of people who have been marginalized for so long. Uh, and that's what I'm excited about, you know, and certainly believe, believe that we will get there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, really helped me to end on a very hopeful and um, um, positive note for the future. Uh, I'm going to move into asking some questions that came from folks in the chat. Um, one question we received is, what have the results been on the community-specific vaccine sites? Are you seeing the vaccine disparity shift at all? Yeah, uh, very good question. So um, there are multiple vaccine sites. Uh, there are vaccine sites that are run by the state, by city, by healthcare providers. Um, and then city and state are working with community-based organizations such as um, you know, you know, Houses of Worship to host community vaccine sites. And we've certainly seen um, uh, you know, more promising impact from smaller sites, uh, you know, just recently we um, opened up sites in Brooklyn at Bed Star Restoration in East New York Community Center. Uh, and we've been working uh, over the last couple of days to really make sure that we are matching those appointments with the residents uh, in, in the community. And it has been a really positive showing. So, you know, those are the incremental um, approaches that we need to, to, to make sure that we can achieve our equity targets. Um, but certainly we we need to we're going to continue to do more uh, and some of the mass vaccination sites you know when you can really focus them on certain zip codes on certain boroughs we also do see um, you know a higher impact of really reaching those in the communities that you want to reach um, and so like continue to employ those strategies uh, that's that's certainly the way that we're going to uh, you know reach our equity targets Another question from the chat. Uh, this is not an easy question. <laughs> How would you create a pipeline to have more black and brown children maintain an interest in science that leads to a career in healthcare? Yeah, um, it, it's, it's not an easy um, question, but it, it is an important question um, and one that I've been part of in, in different ways. Um, and certainly I think there are certainly um, uh, multiple um, 
components that we need to make sure that we have in place. And it really has to start, um, you know, an early education uh, and the exposure uh, that children have to science and to uh, the medical field. And, and not just sort of show and tell, but how do we really engage young children um, just around these topics. Uh, and certainly that is a start and sort of nurturing uh, that that inquiry, uh, nurturing, uh, sort of that critical thinking um, is really important. And really having um, that exposure well into middle school, junior high, and into high school, um, and continue to create those avenues where that exposure is cultivated and nurtured is really important. Um, and I think those are the type of programs that we need to continue to put in place. Uh, I have been a co-founder for an organization called Young Doctors DC, where we have been engaging young um, high school uh, males of color uh, to not only expose them to medical professionals and not just physicians, uh, but therapists, psychologists, um, dentists, uh, scientists, uh, but then also engaging them in uh, science uh, courses, uh, taking them through medical schools, having them through to rotations at clinics and public health departments and uh, at hospitals, but also doing community events. And having those type of programs really expand uh, their understanding of the field uh, and really uh, increase their interest. And those are the programs that continue because there are programs such as that in college and their programs um, such as that that really also help uh, during medical school and beyond, and certainly have been a benefactor of many of those programs, um, and certainly have nurtured my understanding of the field, and also again given me a network. Um, uh, but certainly, there are other things, you know, from mentoring. Uh, certainly, it is really important, and um, there are professional networks that are there. Um, uh, and and you know, I think our educational institutions need to continue to support that this open door policy, like whatever you're initially thinking about, how do you continue to nurture that conversation for that individual? We certainly have seen um, in high school, um, a period of a drop off, and then in college, another period of drop off where students, students of color who are interested in the science no longer pursue that field. And which tells me that the guidance counselor, the person who could have cultivated that interest chose not to. Um, and so it's really important that how do you have, you know, a conversation with someone and open the door uh, for inquiry and open the door for possibilities uh, and not shut that door for that, for that child. There's another question from the chat that I'm actually really curious to hear the answer to as a owner of a city bike membership. I'm just going to read this uh, off. The Center for Health Equity has done some innovative work encouraging active lifestyles for people of color in communities through celebrating bikes. What's the future outlook that of that work now that the pandemic has inspired so many people of color to be open to biking in the current bicycle boom? Yeah, no, that's that's a really good question. Um, I, you know, I think the, the future outlook is still evaluating some of the work that we have done around transportation equity um, and, and seeing the ridership uh, and some of the innovative work of connecting with um, some of our healthcare systems, particularly in Brooklyn, uh, to um, help individuals, particularly who had um, uh, chronic diabetes and chronic hypertension, uh, get city bike membership. And so you know, our team is still evaluating a lot of that data. Um, and I think, you know, as we, um, you know, re-enter back into the community, you know, at some point, you know, really thinking about, you know, how are we continue to have conversations about um, activating green space uh, and public spaces for physical activity. And this is work that we not only do in Brooklyn, but in East Harlem and also in the South Bronx. Um, and I think that those are, those are just some of the ways that I know initially we've been thinking, and I think those partnerships are, are really important, again, not only with um, city government, but also with our healthcare systems. Uh, so 
certainly there's there's more to come there. Um, and you know, this has certainly been important uh, as we have been engaging our community partners about how can we invest in communities to do more of that activation. You know, whether it is um, you know doing murals or activating uh, um, public spaces uh, with resources and activities. And I think those are the ongoing conversations that you know we continue to have. Uh, with our community partners. I love that. Uh, if the spring length weather comes back, I'm definitely going to uh, be thinking about that to ride through the city. Mm -hmm. Awesome. <laughs> okay. I think we have time for one last question. Um, what can New York learn from other states' vaccine distribution and the handling of the COVID-19 crisis? What can the rest of the country learn from New York specifically? Um, uh, I think that there's so much that that you know New York can learn, and that I think there's so much um, that we all can learn. Um, I think that the most important part uh, that if we don't, you know, if we take away one thing, it's the power of messaging. Um, you know, of, of risk communication, public health messaging, and who delivers the message. And so, um, and then that just uh, defines the pandemic in, in so many different ways. And so, um, even though you have um, policy maker, makers delivering that message, how else are you activating other leaders uh, to deliver a message, you know, within their network? And I think, um, um, we did some work to do that, and you know certainly we're doing more of that uh, during this vaccine rollout. Um, and I think you, you see the differences across uh, the country of how messengers were employed or not employed, uh, and I think that's really really important. Um, the other thing that really important is how we share data. Um, I think going forward, we're going to not only think about um, when. We share that data, but how the data is used. Uh, because certainly, um, once we release the race and ethnicity data, um, and the work is not to repeat and not to have these disparities, but then how are you sharing that data? And that data is available for community activators on the ground to use that data and help you do you know, more activations in their neighborhoods, in their networks, uh, and so that you can address those disparities. And so that sharing of information we've heard loud and clear. Um, I think, you know, something that we we, we did um, and countries, I'm sorry, uh, well countries, but states have started to do in their different ways is this idea of um, begin reinvesting or putting resources into those communities. Now, part of this is long-standing disinvestment uh, in public health infrastructure. Um, and, you know, we value our public health systems, um, you know, when we really need them. And then, you know, we just go about our lives and, you know, and sort of our public health infrastructure. So it just continues to protect us, but we don't really pay attention to it. And certainly that disinvestment, you know, leads to how important during a public health emergency, we need to make sure that we can shore up that those resources are there. And so our preparedness becomes so important for during an emergency and after the emergency. Um, and it helps, helps us get through sort of this mitigation period and the suppression phase and our recovery period. And so um, I think a huge lesson is how we need to look to our next emergency in the next 100 years and all the smaller public health emergencies that we're gonna have, the next measles outbreak, the next Zika virus outbreak, right? And how do we make sure that we're prepared for those small public health emergencies and then the next, the next um, pandemic? Thank you for that. Well, I feel so hopeful. I feel um, very excited to see the future of health in New York City under your leadership. So thank you, Dr. Easterling, for being with us this evening. And I'm going to just hand it back over to Sarah and the ADME team. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Joy. It's been a pleasure talking with you this evening. I uh, just want to say thank you so much, and we're we're really lucky to have leaders like you, especially during this time of crisis. Um, 
And it, it's so important to have these conversations and we really appreciate you joining us tonight. Thank you, Joy. Thank you, Dr. Easterling. This concludes our What's on Tap event and we really appreciate you all joining us. Thanks.